also like to thank the leadership and staff of the Department of Culture and Tourism, Abu Dhabi, in particular, Ali Abu Amer and Reem Fada, along with my Guggenheim colleagues, Alexandra Monroe and Rose Demir. I am Syra Levinson. I am Deputy Director and Gail Engelberg, Director of Public Engagement at the Guggenheim Museum. I'd also deeply like to thank our panelists today for joining, Rana Davenport, Unji Ju, and Sarah Rivke. They're joining us from multiple time zones and all hours of the day and night um, in order to be part of this conversation today. For this panel, we will be borrowing the concept of world building as a way to frame our discussion about cultural practice and cultural institutions. This notion comes from the fields of narrative media, i.e. film and game design, and is used quite often in speculative or science fiction writing. And it's built on the notion that the design of the world must come before the telling of the story within that world. It is a discipline in which art, science, and technology come together. World building is also gaining traction more broadly in the cultural sector and the civic space as we feel the urgency of creating new ways of operating in cultural institutions and as we seek to recover and even repair knowledge systems and imagine new frameworks for institutions that center on creating exchange between artists and the broadest publics. Each of our panelists today are engaged in the practice of world building in different ways. In, in their discussion and in their thinking around artistic production, whether it's by reimagining educational programs in the arts and sciences, creating exhibitions and other spaces that bring artists and communities into dialogue, and exploring ways to exist in the world as it is, while moving towards a world that offers more sustained support for an expanded canon and greater dialogue. We'll begin today by hearing from each panelist about their work and their practice and the questions they're asking as they push towards the future that they're helping to both imagine and create. Then we will explore these questions together in dialogue. What might we ask right now to build a path of inquiry from what is to what could be, thinking toward the cultural institutions of the future in the now? And now I'd like to briefly introduce the panelists. Uh, we will hear from them uh, first from Sarah Rivke. Sarah is a writer, curator, entrepreneur, and art historian, currently writing her doctoral dissertation, Cultural Infrastructure in Egypt in the 1950s and 1960s. She co-founded Beirut 2012 to 2015, an art space in Cairo that thinks about institution building as a curatorial act. Her writing has appeared in Art in America, Art Agenda, Bedouin, The Exhibitionist, among others. She is co-editor of the German book, Positions, Contemporary Artists of the Arab World from 2013, and author of The, um, of the Going Insurrection 2012. Rifki is a PhD candidate in the History, Theory, and Criticism program, as well as the Aga Khan program, for Islamic Architecture at the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT. She is also an MIT Legatum and Jacobs Foundation Social Entrepreneur Fellow. Thank you, Sarah, so much for joining us. After Sarah, we will hear from Rana Davenport, ONZM. Rana is Director of the Art Gallery of South Australia in Adelaide. She was previously Director of the Auckland Art Gallery Toy O Tamaki from 2013 to 2018, and Govett Brewster Art Gallery, Glen Lai Center from 2006 to 2013, both in Altoria, New Zealand. Davenport is a curator, writer, and cultural producer whose career spans art museums, biennales, and cultural festivals. Her curatorial interests include contemporary art of Asia and the Pacific, time-based media and social practice, in 2017, Davenport was curator for the New Zealand Pavilion at the Venice Biennale for Lisa Rehana Emissaries. She previously held senior positions with the Biennale of Sydney, the Sydney Festival, 
and the Asia Pacific Triennale of Contemporary Art at the Queensland Art Gallery. In 2018, she was appointed an officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit. Thank you, Rana. We are also joined by Unji Ju, who is curator of contemporary art at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, where she organized Soft Power on October 2019 to February 2020, which was a group exhibition looking at the role of artists as citizens and social actors. She was artistic director of the fifth Anyang Public Art Project, APAP 5 in Korea in 2016, curator of the Sharjah Biennale 12, the past, the present, the possible in 2015, and commissioner of the Korean Pavilion at the 53rd Venice Biennale, condensation, Agu Yang, 2009. From 2007 to 2012, Ju was Keith Herring Director and Curator of Education and Public Programs at the New Museum, where she spearheaded the Museum as Hub Initiative, edited the volume Rethinking Contemporary Art and Multicultural Education from 2009, and organized the 2012 New Museum Generational Triennale, The Ungovernables. Ju was Director and Curator of the Gallery at Red Cat, Los Angeles from 2003 to 2007. Without further ado, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Sarah. Thank you so much. Samuel Moore is a historical painter, set sail from New York to Paris in November 1829. He set himself up in the Louvre, and since the second cholera pandemic was sweeping through Europe, he lived on at the museum for like a little while longer than planned. He wanted to bring the works of great artists, including Da Vinci, Titian, the Leonese, Rubens, back home. So he curated a room of 38 outstanding works, including the Mona Lisa, which became the subject of his painting, Gallery at the Louvre. Morse wanted to create an artwork as exhibition for a land without museums. He miscalculated the interest, thing, the interest the painting would garner and disillusioned with art, he went on to invent the telegraph, a cosmic event that annihilated space. For today, I was asked to expand on a sentence I once wrote in a blog post. I said, every artwork is a school. I also wrote, send institutions to artworks. By that I mean to ask, can museums actually learn from artworks as opposed to merely acquiring, displaying, and circulating them? What if art institutions actually live by the experience and attitude of artworks? I'm convinced that art is nothing. In comparison to the cynicism of power, art is absolutely nothing. Nothing, pain. A manifestation of powerlessness, visionlessness, a blindness, deafness, a pain that lasts in zero. Here I'm loosely quoting the artist Mladen Stilinovich. What Mladen is expressing here is not that art is actually nothing, but that the artwork has been co-opted. When I speak of every artwork as a school, I really mean art thinking, like art thinking is a term that I take from the artist Louis Kamnitz there. So to me, art thinking is, let's say, open, free, associative, complex, doubt-inducing, and far-reaching, and not bound by the limits of labor, means of production, commodity exchange, and so on. Artworks are the dear and necessary byproducts of art thinking. Now, thinking is very unpopular. Just recently, um, Professor Rembe, who was supposed to give a lecture this morning, um, pointed me to an article anthropologist Arjun Akadurai wrote um, on the fear of small disciplines, India's battle against creative thought. In the article, he reflects on why India's ruling regime unleashes its anger and hatred onto creative thinkers, an anger and hatred that is rooted in fear. For him, one of the reasons is that small disciplines, and here I would include art, so, quote, cast doubt on permanent interpretations and sort of resisting dogmatic authorities of every type. Now, doubt is a virtue few museums practice. 
So in art school, artists learn how, how to doubt. And art critic Angela Beteza says, art school is a school of doubt. One teaches a subject that one can't, that cannot be described since art is both an endless challenge and an asymptote. Now, in my remaining time, I want to present in very, very basic and quick terms two artworks, should I one day have to raise a museum, this is where I would send them. The first work, Encumbrance, is a mortgage-based work by Cameron Rowland. Cameron's practice is sort of difficult to succinctly summarize, but it's a close, if complex, demonstration of systemic racism and its historic depth. They think of how institutions, systems, and policies perpetuate injustice, and their work exposes the legal and economic histories of slavery and capitalism. Encumbrance entangles itself with the space that actually hosts it, the Institute of Contemporary Art in London. And the ICA is located at 12 Carlton House Terrace and was built by George IV in the 1820s and has been owned by the Crown, Crown Estate since 1716. Here, the building includes four mahogany doors and one mahogany handrail. And Britain was big on this type of wood um, for all sorts of things, especially Georgian and Regency style furniture. Mahogany was felled and milled by slaves of British colonies, including Jamaica, Barbados, and Honduras. And the timber, it was an important commodity in the 18th century, still generates value for those who export it today. What Cameron's project entails is arranging for the mahogany elements to be mortgaged by the ICA, the art institution, to Encumbrance Incorporated, an organization he creates. Every, each, each of the five items is um, being mortgaged for like a thousand British pounds each. The ICA will not pay off its loans and Encumbrance Inc. will retain security interest for the outstanding debts. Encumbrance diminishes a property's value. Um, what the artwork does as reparation is to limit the property's continued accumulation of value for the Crown Estate, which provides 75% of its revenue to the Treasury and 25% directly to the monarch. The project is a way of thinking with history about the property relation of enslaved people, other aspects of the work demonstrate how plantation mortgages are exemplary in showing how the value of enslaved, enslaved people, the land they were for, forced to labor on, and the houses they were forced to maintain were all mutually constitu constitutive. Every large plantation debt was a mortgage debt, and enslaved people functioned as collateral for their master's debt. And the taxation of plantation production is important to Britain and of interest paid to lenders provides revenue for the British Parliament and income for the monarch. Now, property is preserved through inheritance. And what's meant by inheritance here is not a financial asset that's handed down from generation to generation. What it means is the shared inheritance of a given infrastructure and community that provides us with institutions and with spaces. The next project I want to present is The Council um, by Adelita Hosni Bey. In 2017, the Museum of Modern, uh, Modern Art in New York hosted The Council, a workshop convened by Adelita um, in the founder's room of the MoMA and included the participation of alumni from the MoMA sort of teen, uh, teens program. The work is a speculative response to a catastrophe that is not COVID and that is yet to befall us but always seems just beyond the imaginings of the future. A market crash, a system failure, a revolution gone wrong. In the face of these disasters not yet surpassed, the teens divided into four groups and deliberated over radical proposals to critically reimagine and repurpose the museum. After the event rendered obsolete, the, the museum's primary mission of caring for, collecting, displaying, and archiving artworks. In a post-collapse moment, the museum is transformed into a shelter. So I'm here just sort of showing one very sort of small part of the project. Um, you can see here on the one hand, the Ecofeminist Committee, um, which proposed to transform the institution into a vertical garden. Um, first, 
they sort of detail the in environmental apocalypse before going on to propose the following. You can see the full statement on the screen. Um, I'll just sort of read a small part where it says, plants will grow over and around and on all of the works of art in the museum, the terrace on the fifth floor um, will be expanded and will serve as a grow area, as well as rainwater collection site and a wind farm to generate electricity for the institution. The institution will serve as a sort of vertical park open to the public as a space for socialization and reflection, as well as a space to witness the earth overtake man-made art. And with that, I will sort of conclude only to say that I want to imagine that museums can live by the experience of these artworks among others. I demand of museums not only in the future, but today to reckon with the shared inheritance of given infrastructures and to more readily provide the structures that allow for the freedom to create new worlds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. To pass the presentation now over to Rana. Thanks so much, and uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, so. So Ghana Yatanga Yuandi, uh, AGSA, where I work, the Art Gallery of South Australia, stands on Ghana land, and I honour the uh, elders past, present and emerging, and I pay my respects to um, Indigenous peoples across the world. So uh, this is the, the museum in Adelaide. It was uh, a museum born of civic enthusiasm, as many museums were in 1881. We're entering our 140th year. Uh, there was 47,000 works in the collection, the only site-specific Donald Judd in the summer, Southern Hemisphere, and um, a rather large collection of um, Rodans and William Morris, amongst other things. Um, interesting, you mentioned Arjuna Padurai before, and I'm often um, referencing um, Apadurai's mention of art as um, the work of the social imagination. So uh, I'm going to just go through a number of um, aspects of some of the work that we're involved with. I've been uh, with the museum for two years now, and I thought it'd be um, more interesting perhaps to, to look um, closely at some of the projects we're undertaking. Firstly, thinking about the collection itself, um, thinking about context and um, contraposition, um, commissions, interventions, and renegotiating um, through conversations amongst work, and uh, thinking about world building um, and William Gibson, this idea of the collectible as the basic mammalian response to the bewildering flood of sheer stuff we produce. So, um, and in a museum working with a lot of work in our collection, uh, it, it's something that um, it, it constantly changes. So um, our collection hang is a historical, transtemporal, and iterative. Uh, and um, so uh, the elder wing uh, of Australian art uh, juxtaposes work from um, scoping from many um, parts of the world. And, uh, and here in our Melrose ring of, um, of historical art and primarily European, there's a large collection of British art in the collection. Um, you'll see a very recent acquisition of Lynette Yard and Boake with our Gainsborough with a, a, a contemporary work by a South Australian artist. Uh, Chiharu Shiota uh, also has a, a permanent work uh, in the international wing. And touring, I'll just mention a couple of projects. Uh, John Morangel, um, senior, very important Aboriginal artist from Yorkala, and I'll talk about that soon, touring with MCA across the country. And uh, Living Rocks, fragment of the universe created by radical farmers in South Australia and presented as a collateral event at the last Biennale in Venice. And uh, a touring exhibition of Ben Quilty that uh, toured, he was a war artist uh, in Afghanistan amongst other things. And, uh, and uh, this exhibition toured Australia. Thinking about exhibition making, 
Of course, there is a, a strong focus on, on recovery and uh, the almost forgotten. And here, uh, two artists, father and son, John and David Dalwicks and their work with, uh, with um, 1970s modernism. William Kentridge, a certainly well-known artist with his marvelous um, exhibition, That Which We Do Not Remember, looking at poetic and sculptural and, and uh, filmic installations, drawing on memory, literature, and incorporating um, scenographic transformation of the spaces. Um, recently, we presented Li Ming Wei in um, his project Sonic Blossom, and uh, which was an intervention in the Australian wing, uh, and particularly looking at uh, the strong influence of Afghan cameleers that came in the 1800s to South Australia. And Restless Dance, uh, they are a, a dance group that is informed by uh, disability and their response in the exhibition space was to our collection of George Ruolt. Also, uh, this very important document, uh, the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, is, seeks constitutional change, legislative change, and the Makarata Commission seeking truth-telling. And uh, we were the, uh, the first uh, art museum in the country to present that uh, political document uh, that has not been responded to uh, in, a, in a comprehensive way from the government. So within the art museum, there are three constants. There's the Adelaide Biennial of Australian Art, Tarnandi Festival of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Art, Ramsey Art Prize, all three are uh, projects dealing with uh, contemporary Australian art. So there's a, a, a constant uh, flow in, an, in the annual schedule of uh, projects working intensely in um, experimentation in relation to contemporary Australian art. I, I, um, I, I quite like this quote of Ulafa Elison talking about museums as being co-producers of models of reality rather than uh, reality producers or reality containers. The Adelaide Biennial of Australian Art Monster Theatres ended up being um, a very uh, prescient exhibition exploring ideas of manifestations of desire, fear, warnings and consequences set in a tableau of arenas of action. There are extraordinary um, uh, works that really became a portent of what was to come, such as Makala Dwyer's Sick Bay for the medical, that is, uh, metaphysical healing at the entrance to the gallery that you saw in the very first slide. The exhibition, of course, only opened for two weeks and then we had 10 weeks of recovery. Um, and, um, and in that, um, that quiet time, we had time to uh, reconsider all aspects of our work as did all museums in the world. Uh, so this is another image from uh, the Adelaide Biennial, a very beautiful work by an Aboriginal artist, Iwani uh, Scarce, uh, where she activated what was a mortuary in the Botanic Gardens. And finally, uh, Stellark, who uh, works with robotics and technology. And this work actually continued 24 hours a day for the full 10 weeks of closure and anybody around the world could activate this, activate this sculpture. During this time, obviously, we did a lot of cleaning up in the museum, which um, is something we never get a chance to do. And, uh, and of course, uh, presented a, a lot of activity uh, by video and also um, uh, redirected funding from our uh, patrons to uh, directly to offer artist bursaries for artists in South Australia. Also, we really thought about our program and radically changed the program as it was moving forward. And this is a project um, that we really were wanting to recalibrate narratives of Australian art, rethinking the program. Uh, she's an artist who was working in the 30s and 20s, uh, only worked for 16 years. She died very young at 48. And uh, this was, uh, and thinking about exhibitions that uh, that were exhibitions that needed to be done and exhibitions that needed to be done now. And this was an exhibition that um, that had been under consideration for a long time by the curator, but came together very quickly. And here thinking about Harold, Harold Siemens um, quote about poems uh, in space, exhibitions as poems in space. The exhibition arcs from 
the morning from, from um, sunrise through to high noon, to dusk, to sunset, to twilight, to nocturnes with um, commissioned soundscapes in each room. And uh, the exhibition is on uh, currently and is really uh, triggering a very uh, strong and positive response from audiences who uh, have um, engaged very deeply with uh, the idea of slow looking that is being presented within the ex exhibition space. I wanted to finally um, close with uh, Tarnandi, one of the three regular exhibitions that, um, that I mentioned before. And Tarnandi, a festival of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art has a presence every year at the gallery. Uh, there's also um, an art fair associated uh, performances. Uh, often we bring three to 400 artists from across the country. And, Tarn and Tarnandi literally means in the language of Ghana people, um, the, the coming to light or the, the first light that appears at dawn. So it's an open platform for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists uh, curated from uh, the very beginning uh, from uh, curator and artist uh, Nikki Cumston. But first the Ursula Le Guin uh, quote about learning which questions are unanswerable and not to answer them is the skill that we need in times of stress and darkness. Uh, this, um, Nikki has worked with the project as artistic director from the very beginning. Uh, this is a project called Collada Juta that happened in 2017 and is a response to the, uh, the British um, nuclear tests that happened in South Australia and have resulted in large tracts of land that are still inhabitable. And uh, this project involved the reclamation of, of spear making by the traditional owners of the APY lands. Um, and uh, this, this creation of a work of 500 spears, uh, as well as, as video and sculptural components. Uh, also in Tarnandi, uh, artist um, Wukun Wannabe from Yokala, which I mentioned earlier, and uh, his interactive video project. And I just wanted to mention the art centres and there's um, within the ecology in Australia, there's a very interesting uh, activity happening within art centres. And uh, Wukun comes from Bukulangne Moka Centre, which was an Indigenous community controlled by, by the local community in Yokala in Northern Territory, 70, 700 uh, kilometres east of Darwin. Uh, Yolnu culture is the culture of the area. It involves the, uh, the Buku Langne Mulka Centre involves print studios, um, an archiving studio, uh, production studios uh, with ceremonial knowledge filming, film projects, um, musical production, uh, dance production and touring. Uh, the area was originally founded as a Methodist church mission in 1934. Five, but since uh, really from 1100 AD, there's been a lot of uh, trade and intermingling with the Makassan people of Indonesia. So it's been very much a, um, a, a site of exchange. Uh, and always since, um, since the artists of Yokala have been working together, there has been a very strong synergy with political agency and art making. For example, a collection of 80 bark paintings made by 47 artists toured from 1998 to 2001 and formed part of a tremendously important legal case which um, gave determination of sea rights for Yolngu people. Also from uh, Buku Langne Mulka is Nongana Marawili. Uh, she's the daughter of the artist that I mentioned right in the very beginning and Jonathan Jones with his work uh, Bunha Bunhanga. Uh, and in this project, he referenced Bill Pascoe, Aboriginal writer who wrote a book called Dark Emu, which is um, a radical um, exploration about Aboriginal land management and this uh, and how um, Aboriginal people have been managing lands, uh, the lands for, um, for centuries. And this again was very poignant with his juxtaposition and curating in, in the historical part of the gallery. But also, of course, while this exhibition was on, uh, there was devastating bushfires um, raging across Australia. Ryan Presley's Blood Money Exchange is, uh, is a participatory um, uh, installation where you can exchange Australian dollars for blood money dollars, each one with a, um, a small miniature uh, representation of 
his insertion of Aboriginal leaders into uh, currency exchange. Artist Betty Muffler and Marinka Burton, who featured in the exhibition last year called Open Hands, uh, they are both Nunkri or spiritual healers and their painting is an extension of their own healing energies. Uh, Tanadi uh, 2020, which um, has just finished, and these uh, mother and daughter open hands looked at matrilineal uh, histories, and uh, these artists uh, work on Kwandamuka on Stradbroke Island with a reclamation of weaving techniques, including researching collections around the world and uh, documenting those um, and, and identifying those weaving techniques. Naomi Hobson from far north Queensland. And I'm just going to finish with um, the, uh, a wonderful image from um, I Want Your Arts, which is uh, one of the art centres as part of the APY um, lands. And uh, the, there's been a tremendous emergence of um, animation from art centres. And we worked with the um, Adelaide Film Festival in presenting a series of those shorts, which we're now touring. So in conclusion, one of the questions that we were asked is what are the guiding principles to reimagine the ethics and responsibilities of today's cultural institutions? In respect of the, the projects that I'm, I'm uh, introducing here today, I think there's um, three answers to that. Firstly, know where you are and keep asking questions. Secondly, be co-producers and provide the platform. And finally, listen to artists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rana. Those last three points were so important. I might ask you to say them again when we get to the discussion. <laughs> but um, Unji, I'm turning the mic over to you. Okay, I'm going to try to do this correctly. <laughs> Hello, um, I just wanted to start with a little bit of a kind of idea of a practice in three parts. So um, I'm going to start with the period of time when I was the director of education and public programs at the New Museum in New York. And for me, doing that kind of a job coming from something that was more strictly curatorial into um, thinking more about the discursive and uh, the way in which art interacts with the public is really kind of following what Sarah and Rana were just talking about. I think, you know, I, I love Sarah's emph uh, emphasis on the artwork and then Rana's in, uh, emphasis on the institution, what the institution can do, because I think in between there is our role as curators and, and what we do in order to mediate between the two. And for me, uh, what's important there was, um, this trend that we saw very strongly in our generation, let's say uh, people in their maybe 50s now, um, in the mid 2000s where artists were starting to do a lot of discursive work and performative work. And so it was timely to go to the new museum and think about uh, what a non-collecting institution might do. And sorry, my, my slides got ahead of me. But one of the important things that happened there was a project by Anton Vidokli um, a year-long artist commission in the form of a temporary school. And that project brought together artists in the, say, public community um, to think through art thinking, you know, something that Sarah was just talking about, and to uh, not only emphasize art as exhibition or object, uh, but to think through time together. That developed into a second major discursive program called Propositions, which was a monthly forum for artists and cultural thinkers to explore ideas in progress. And then a response or research period um, with guest speakers and finally a discussion with the public. So here's an image of Kara Walker doing her uh, project about um, how paintings uh, will find liberty. Through the museum as hub, we were able to develop a major publication um, called the Art Spaces Directory. Sarah was actually part of the museum as hub uh, for the 
for the Tannhaus Museum in Cairo, along with the Museo uh, Tamayo in Mexico City, the Von Abe Museum in Eindhoven, and uh, INSA Art Space and later Art Space Pool in Seoul. This directory brought together um, maybe four information on about 400 spaces with public hours in 96 countries. And it also led to a triennial exhibition in, in 2012 called The Ungovernables, um, which was based largely in uh, working directly with artists and having artists lead us. And um, over the last decade, uh, or over the last, let's say, year, I've been thinking a lot about the past decade and, um, and how we were framing the practice while we were at our busiest, uh, meaning when there was no time to stop and assess what the impact of what we were doing was, was or could be, but maybe, you know, always working to create a context through which you could uh, understand better the work of our peers. And so, I, I was thinking about the idea, Sarah, that you started um, this session off with in terms of world building. And I was thinking that this is the period of time where we were trying to actually establish the world we were expecting to inhabit, but didn't yet exist. And I think that continues to be a struggle for curators, whether they have a more formal institutional practice or maybe a more philosophical practice. These are just some images from the perennial residencies and the, the exhibition itself. Um, some of the same artists that my colleagues have uh, been showing and, and working with. And I wanted to, to include this slide because there was a moment, you know, where um, for the opening of the Ungovernables, the 2012 triennial, we actually invited, I think, 30 some artists uh, in one talk together and to speak to each other about their practice and ask their, each other their own questions. And it was very interesting because it became a kind of um, opportunity for the public to see how artists talk to each other. And I think it might be a little bit different than um, the way the public sometimes speaks to artists and even the way the institution sometimes speaks to artists. Um, this is, these are next images are from site visits and uh, the, the exhibition, The Past, the Present, the Possible from Sharjah Biennial 12. Uh, I was speaking to um, one of the artists that I worked with on this project and he reminded me that probably one of the most important things of my, of my contribution to Sharjah Biennial was that I actually moved to the United Arab Emirates in order to understand the context um, that better to better understand the context I was working in um, and to try to understand the pace of the place. And I thought that, you know, from our study of the biennial that we could use this format to develop long-term infrastructure. I think this is something we spoke about a lot since the late nineties, um, how we could take a temporary structure or uh, a temporary opportunity and develop it into to have some longevity or to, you know, kind of use an experimental format. Um, as the role and uh, necessity and potential of biennial format continue to be in, interrogated, I think it's important to contemplate the locatedness of the biennial and its relevance. So I was, I was also thinking back to, to the preparation for this project and I was remembering that, that that the approach to the biennial was in fact uh, based on a conversation with the artist Jan Bo in 2013 about how contemporary art might in fact help us to overcome the limitations of a history that continues to haunt, how artists offer a way of thinking abstract enough to suggest new realities, and how contemporaries, how curators can approach exhibition making better. He reminded me of the need to use artist positions to consider new policies new possibilities for social organization and to consider how to organize systems and how to rearrange cultural and political confinement. I think a big part of thinking about the discursive and, and working directly with artists in real time 
is to promote discursivity and to allow artists to speak, but not to theorize over them. To quote Jimmy Durham, I have the idea that there's something about visual art that is the intellectual part of the visual that is away from language and that its value is that it is away from language. It is a knowledge that is not connected to language. When I have some great experience with a work of art, work with a work of something that I love, the important part of it, what's moving to me, what changes me is the part that's knowledge that cannot be explained in language. And that makes me feel suddenly free because I think at least partly I'm suddenly free of this prison of words, the prison of language. And finally, I just wanted to share some images of what it has uh, meant for me to work for a collecting institution and how um, in the past three and a half years, I made a move to um, a, a, a collecting institution, the SF MoMA um, here in California, in order to make international contemporary exhibitions, commission new works, and shepherd works into the permanent collection as an application of what has been learned from more experimental or temporal artist-led forms. Soft Power was, um, as Sarah mentioned briefly, an exhibition about the role of artist as citizen. And here are just a few examples, which also focus on works that were collected by the exhibition, uh, by the institution, and works that cannot be collected. And here I'll quote one of the participants of the exhibition, uh, Tuan Andrew Wynn, who wrote, I don't subscribe to the idea that repair is an option within a post-colonial context where so much has been decimated historically. But I do think that shared compassion is an immensely useful tool philosophically and in practice. It is completely constructive without being victim to the past and while, without being subservient to the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what I'm going to attempt to do is to read back some of the things that I heard in your three presentations, which were incredibly inspiring, and to see if we can um, we can accept Ursula Le Guin's um, premise that we best not try to answer the unanswerable questions. But instead, perhaps what we can work towards is um, a clearer refinement of what those questions are um, as we're thinking towards the practice from now um, to what to what can be. And so here are a couple of things I thought I heard, and I'm going to pass it back to all of you to tell me whether I'm hearing correctly or whether you care to correct. And if you want to build off of the things that that you each have, have said in this amazing conversation. So one thing I heard from Sarah is the, the, the question, can museums embrace doubt? Um, we so often have been built on uh, the accumulation of fact or of the concretes. And it is um, so difficult, I think, in that environment to imagine uh, the unraveling, which I think you're all presenting as part of the work that artists do. Sarah, I also, also heard you talk about art thinking as a kind of thinking that's open, free, associative, complex, and far-reaching. I may have missed a few because I was writing as fast as I could. <laughs> but how does art thinking and embrace of doubt find its way in, in, into our future institutions? Um, Rana, where you left us um, with a sort of, I, I think, a, in a way, a rubric or a framing for how to sort of gu guide yourself as you're trying to make decisions. Um, in that space in between, in GSU, it's described the artist practice and the receiver of that practice with, with, um, without, with um, respect to both and with the right amount of visibility slash invisibility as the interlocutor. Um, I heard, Rana, you suggest that we remember to know where we are, to keep asking questions, to listen to artists, to be co-producers and to provide the, 
the platform. And Inji, I, I heard actually the echoes of all of those things in the work that you described. So along with the notion that um, we embrace the work of artists, which is both beyond language, sometimes not interested in language, which leaves us with an interesting conundrum today as we're only speaking in language, verbal language together um, to discuss things that perhaps can't best be captured that way. Um, but also that artists can um, abstract ideas enough to offer new realities. And I saw that in all of the work that you each presented. And so those are a lot of thoughts. I'm not sure which one you want to pick up on, but as I imagine the sort of world building exercise that we've put in front of ourselves, which is to change the parameters um, or to build off of the parameters that you've been developing each of you in your practice over time, I'm wondering if anything uh, there sticks or if you'd like to make further comments or if you have questions for each other in our remaining time. Maybe, um, maybe Sarah, I'm, I'm interested uh, because it's such a, a fascinating concept, the idea of world building. Uh, and, uh, and, and maybe can you speak a little more to that idea as well in relation to the research you've been doing? That was a question for Sarah, correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I haven't been so much, uh, I mean, I, I practice writing and working with artists. I don't so much research world building as an objective thing out there in the world. Um, I I would say, I was just sort of picking up on maybe what kind of Unji was saying earlier in terms of how the last 10 years were also partially an exercise in um, sort of imagining, like imagining that we were kind of building a world that we would come to inhabit. Um, and I think if one were to take that within, like, a, like back into like our practice as uh, artists, as curators, as critics, as art historians and so on. Um, I think the, the, the sort of this, the slight sort of destabilization of, of what one is building is actually kind of important, I would say. Um, I, I, do, I do sort of struggle, I guess, between like that kind of modality and actually thinking like in a, in a the sort of sobriety that one sort of is encountered with when one actually um, is on the in the field doing the work. So I guess my, my question would be, to what extent is this? I mean, it is possible within the realm of of like of representation of, of like of the exhibition making to actually bring those ideas and to actually allow for um, you know for for difficult questions. Uh, to be sort of addressed. I guess my my question, maybe both to Unji and to Rana, to, given the breadth of your institutional experience, is to what extent do you imagine it is possible to actually take those difficult questions, um, like to the root of like infrastructure itself, right? Like how boards function, how museums are. and the policies of cities and so on. Um, so perhaps this would be sort of for me the kind of, uh, I wanted to kind of address, I guess, that as a question, because I think it is within that site that I think um, this is the site that we don't often talk about, but that I think is also very co-constitutive um, of like, uh, like the actuality of how things can be imagined. Thanks, Sarah. I think it's a it's a great question to put out there, and and I think it brings me back to something that you said in your presentation about, you know, the the threat of small disciplines as they cast doubt on stable ideas or stable forms. Uh, in this case, we could say institutions, um, museums, even. Um, and I think this idea that the art artwork artist themselves itself are the challenge, are the endless challenge. And that we as curators and writers are the mediator of that challenge. You know, so it's sometimes, you know, that the challenge might not 
might not speak in the same language as the institution, but we actually come to learn the, the language of the institution. And I think when we also align ourselves with artists fully and perhaps continue to also cast out on the very institutions that we build. Um, I think that's how we can uh, keep things in motion and, and recognize that history is only read through the present, you know, so that we can only, that we have to continually kind of uh, enact a, a form of self-reflexivity on our own practice and our own institutions so that we can match the forms that we actually are mediating. And I think, you know, that's something that I, I find, uh, uh, I don't know if it's something that happens, you know, 10 years ago, you know, was very lively in the art world, let's say 10 years ago, because um, in the past 10 years, there's been some kind of consolidation of professionalization and form and a new a new way of formalism through the market which has you know alienated us from our own practices at, at some level or if it's really you know corresponding to our age and our idealism <laughs> you know I can't tell which is which uh, certainly but um, but I do think that if we've benefited from our lockdown because unlike Australia we you know we were open for seven weeks in the last year not closed for seven weeks. So um, if there's one benefit, it, it perhaps is that we had time to think about what we did, why we did it, and, and question if that was really true. And um, I'm always, um... I'm always thinking about examples with artists, you know, with, with these ideas and um... There was a project we did at the Auckland Art Gallery and uh, for the Walters Art Prize. And one of the artists who was selected for the prize, um, Kusulate Uhila, is, uh, did a project where he'd actually given up making art and he'd gone to Bible school. Um, and, uh, and when we invited him to do the project, he reconstituted a project. He, had previously done only for 10 days because it was shut down because it was um, too difficult for him, but he was living homeless. Um, homelessness is a big issue in um, Auckland. And he was living homeless uh, at, at a, a small uh, contemporary art space. So how to take this you know, enormously beautiful, large um, art museum and, uh, and invite the artist to, with integrity, uh, present his work. So what he did do is he lived in the park, which is also a, a very active place for homeless in, in um, Auckland. And he did it through winter for three months. So uh, it, it involved working with police who were, um, um, look, who often look, look after and, and take care uh, with the homeless through that process, but also it involved working with the, the mission in Auckland and um, it started a whole uh, awareness program and, and conversations and um, uh, donations and money were raised, et cetera, et cetera. But, but, it's, but through the process too, um, it, it created um, and, and it created a whole the, with the meetings that we were having with the police, the meetings with security, the meetings that we we're having internally, um, everyone's care and safety of the artist uh, and 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 yet this notion that we were um, in an unknown territory. And through this process, I think the organization was, more vulnerable, more open, more porous. And um, I don't think, I can't say that questions were answered, you know, I mean, it, uh, and, and it raised many more questions, but that process of a constant con conversation, I think really shifted um, the, 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 the sensibility and really the psyche of, 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 a, of, of the, um, the institution. So, um, yeah, artists, you know, artists, artists show us the way always. Can I ask, um, one thing I noticed is that no one used the word audience. I don't think I've heard it once. And audience is typically the word that we use in our field to talk about those who come to visit. 
And it's a word I find quite troubling because I think it connotes a very passive sort of group sitting together <laughs> with a third wall intact, if you will, take the metaphor from theater. And I'm, I'm intrigued by the fact that you didn't use it. And I'm also wondering as you, have you spoken so much about the way that artists uh, change institutions and um, the, how important it is to take the lead, how you also in your practice think about the, the participant, the other, I would imagine in my thinking, at least in my practice, the other 50% of the equation, if the artist or the artwork is 50%, then the, those who activate those who activate it and come to see it, but uh, are the other 50%, but is there a new word we can use? Or is there a new way to think about those participants? Um, and I heard that language emerging in your presentations. I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more. Yeah, I mean, I want to jump in, and although I didn't really address that so much, but I'm, I think this question is probably more for like when I'm only, but I'm going to hijack it. Um, yeah, I feel like I, I don't know, as you said, of course, like well, the, the notion of audience is a bit kind of antiquated and passive. I think maybe in a more like, a, like progressive sense, one speaks about the public, you know, like uh, the public as, as, as a, I mean, like public, but also in the in the sort of meta sense, like not just sort of as an audience, but the public could also be past, you know, like in the past, it could be in the present, but it can also be in the future. Um, so like sometimes, you know, work, like for example, let's say like this, 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 this painting I showed, you know, the public of this work, you know, was in the future, it wasn't in its time. <laughs> so I think sometimes, you know, like they're, they're, it's not sort of a synchronous practice, sometimes, Again, I mean, you you have great artists producing work at the turn of the century, women especially, and who who really only come into their time like you know much later, perhaps. And I think um, there are works from now that speak to 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 from you know that you know that speak to the past in that regard. So I think public would be the you know, if one had to sort of uh, use a, a word that that would also kind of like in, in, insist on the political potentiality of what it means to come together. And I think with Adelita's practice at large, there's like a lot of um, like talk about gathering. Like it is, it's not so much just the outcome, but what, what does it mean for, you know, all these teenagers to come together and be doing something together. And in some way they kind of are the nucleus of the public of the, pro you know, of the project in the first place. Um, so again, one can be producer public and sort of switch roles. Thank you. I can speak a little to that as well. I mean, I, I would say that I probably favor the word public because it means that the um, those who interact with the work or the artist, you know, they actually have the right to be passive, you know, because I, I also don't think, you know, we can demand interest or, you know, respect or, or discursive, you know, like engagement with everyone. So I think, you know, we put something out, you know, we put something out, it leaves your control, but, you know, as it leaves your control, have you done what you can do so that when it's received by somebody else, it could actually be, you know, legible or something like this. When, when I worked in Sharj, it was one of the interesting things, um, and it, it was kind of a response to many years of going to biennials where uh, English or European speaking curators came into the global south, let's say, or near the global south um, and didn't put subtitles in local languages. Um, so onto videos or, or, you know, important texts that mediated works. Um, that when we worked in Sharjah, you know, we really thought a lot about how to deal with language. And so one of the ways that um, the, my, my uh, associate curator, Ryan Inoue, and I worked on this was to actually um, avoid language. So we, we really restricted the amount of works that we included that had language subtitle um, or, you know, really um, narrative forms. And we tried to, to find uh, the experiential through things that did not depend on Arabic or Urdu or English or French, you know? And, and it really helped us to feel that we had the possibility to communicate. 
And so I think that's one of the ways in which I hope, you know, that that to me is a way of, you know, thinking about the public and its complexity without being able to solve it. You know, you know, putting it back out almost like a question, but making an attempt. And I think when we're in when we're in more traditional institutions like SFMOMA, um, sometimes we forget that we should that we can't be all things to all people. And it's it's quite a burden. Yes. Um, very interesting to think about how we consider our, our public and uh, and a, as you said, um, and you'd like to have um, works that really expect participation. You know, one of the projects in Monster Theatres invited you to lie down in a very beautiful cabin and sleep with bees. So underneath um, this, this platform was the, the queen and, um, and her, her hive and uh, in the botanic gardens. And, and so it required a commitment and given I'm allergic to bees, I had to think very carefully about whether I would, you know, go down that path, which was a, a wonderful experience. And also, of course, um, you know, the extraordinary Stellark and his, and his manipulation of reclining stick man and, and pressing buttons or being on a computer at home, being able to manipulate and, and control this, you know, 20 meter robot in the space. And really, is it a kind of, I suppose, an antithesis to that completely is, is as, as I was talking about the Clarice Beckett exhibition. And again, as you were saying, Sarah, you know, I, I, having, having worked predominantly with contemporary art until very recent, re recently, you know, and always of the adage of, you know, great art was always contemporary once. And, and um, with the work of Clarice Beckett and how it's absolutely hitting a chord with our audiences and and it's really and and also it is part of the Adelaide Festival and so the festival directors spoke you know this is only um, a few days ago and um, they they totally understood the you know the scenographic the theatrical aspect but none of that was there for artifice it was all about tapping into the sensibility of the artists but it's also thinking about making an exhibition at this time when people's experience of museums is perhaps more tentative and um, perhaps they're taking more time uh, and they're, ex they're wanting um, and a different kind of experience uh, that this art was able to give. And it doesn't matter how wonderful the scent scenography is if the if the art's not there it's not there but but it, it's quite interesting sort of flipping from you know very invitational work or in the case of Lee Ming Wei it's you know it's someone asking if they'd like to receive a gift of song and and um, people in Adelaide are quite polite so I think everybody said yes um, but in in uh, in Auckland uh, and in New Zealand particularly Maori culture you know singing is very important so people sang back to the to the singer as well, which hasn't happened elsewhere. So, um, I think publics behave in different um, ways uh, based on situations, and it's it's been very interesting. You know, we've been open since June now, but it's only now that uh, um, that it seems that uh, the the audience has a level of of confidence. I mean, we're tremendously fortunate to be in the situation we're in. And I absolutely feel for all my colleagues everywhere around the world with the difficulties, but it's, um, but it's, it's very interesting that whole thinking about slow looking and also not, not knowing how audiences are going to respond as well and really not knowing. And um, it's, it's been quite um, a fascinating process. I wanted to toss one more question, which is probably longer than a 10 minute answer, but that's how much time we have left. So feel free to do with this what you want. But I heard, Sunji, you mentioned this, and I think it's echoed in Rama and Sarah as well, that the last decade, in a sense, has been an exercise in world building. And that this past year feels like an inflection point um, or a point in which things are shifting or have shifted. And so I'm wondering if you have thoughts about what this 
next phase is or where we take that past decade of experience um, next um, or what's, you know, what's changed as a result of this past year. Um, have we left the decade of world building in fact, um, or is it in fact, or is it more like the time to really think about what took place over the last year and be de and be declarative, be definitive about the things we've taken from that time. So I, I open that up to you for, for your thoughts. I'll start and say, I want to, um, I, we, we had this great, uh, training at the museum by, um, somebody from, I think from who, who, who maybe is a professor or did her, her doctorate at Stanford in the business school. And she was teaching us about Generation Z. And, and I was so fascinated because I think there's a great potential in, in their like um, over the over importance of technology on them, because I think it has disrupted history for them. You know, I think things lay flat instead of through time. And, you know, at its best, that has liberatory possibilities. Because I think that, you know, whereas we may have been really reacting to a lot of limitations on us, uh, they may be able to avoid certain kinds of constrictions. And so, you know, I want to put forward that even, you know, not quite Gen Z, but this this kind of generation after Sarah is also full of this potential because their limit is quite different. And so I hope that, that, that what they do with their over knowledge, like, you know, it's like you can't respond to everything. There's too much, uh, uh, there's too much information. There's, um, you know, quite an overload of, of everything. So, so things lose their specificity as they gain other specificities that we didn't focus on in the past, I think that has liberatory possibilities for our field. I'm throwing that out there because I know Sarah will pick up. Thank you. Sarah, it's yours. I mean, I don't have so much to add. I don't think I think you I think you kind of covered it all correctly, but I mean, I'll, I'll actually, I've been thinking a little bit about the question I dodged uh, from uh, Rana earlier with regard to uh, world building in general and what that kind of uh, means for my practice. I always wonder, it always comes up, I'm like, do I engage with, I'm too tethered, I think, to, to the here and now. I think the way, with the, like the way within which I work, I want to work from, um, I want to I want to not work with the assumption that things are going to be the way they are like in 10, 20, 30 years. And I want to work with the worst case scenario. Um, in the sense that again, I mean, I again I I have I moved to the US and like six years ago. Um, and I'm part of a new uh, emerging uh, diaspora, so, so I'm young in that sense. Um, and I think I've also seen the entire sort of art world sort of shift and change quite uh, ra like radically, um, like since I uh, since I started uh, being involved in art almost 20 years ago when I was a student. And so I I realized that, that at every possible stage. Uh, the future is very different from what we imagined. <laughs> like, um, it is so different, in fact, that uh, I cannot build any assumption on the trajectory of what the practice will look like or what will actually be um, preserved or uh, what will be lost or how, or even how things are going to be remembered. Like even that uh, changes and it's like, it's a very unstable uh, thing. Um, so, so I think, yeah, so I think when, even though I'm a little bit tethered to, 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 to reality, I, I, I do try to, to think almost within these sort of slightly uh, dystopian sort of, uh, uh, sort of apocalyptic <laughs> kind of imaginations, which is perhaps why I'm uh, sort of, again, uh, so remembered by like the council project with uh, Adelita. Um, I, I do realize that uh, increasingly for for us who work with younger kids, like um, 
there is a there is a much stronger anxiety about the future and younger generations to kind of to go back to thinking about like Gen Z and Alpha and all that. Um, so, so I think like I, I'm trying to to imagine what it is to sort of be in that middle, right? Like to 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 have known art as it has been and to understand that it will not be that. Um, and also, I think the, the there is a, like there's still like a, a lot of things that are that, that we're not kind of accounting for, like in terms of like a, um, like mediums, in terms of circulation, in terms of technology, in terms of how these things are actually shifting, um, like everyday life. I mean, there's been an acceleration, obviously, in the last year. Um, and I'm interested in seeing to what extent one can use some of these things and like lever them. Um, toward the future. Um, Louis Kamnitzer, whom I love, is extremely anti, for example, thinking about uh, STEM. He hates STEM. He hates it with a vengeance. Um, I am at the MIT, so I have uh, unfortunately grown, well, fortunately, but I, if anybody's listening, uh, no, I, much love. Um, I, I've, uh, I've grown a little bit fond and curious about uh, sort of uh, STEM disciplines and not just sort of STEM for the sake of STEM, but also to, uh, trying to understand like how we can actually bring STEM back into the arts. And I think the, the again, the, the, the painting that I started off with sort of again has been, um, it was sort of suggested to me by Walid Raad a while ago when I was thinking about something else. And sort of somehow it sort of stands for me at that particular uh, center. It was suggested to me because I was thinking, what would it be to try to create a low cost decentralized graduate program for the arts that um, in like inverted the sort of steam into a STEM model, so STEM in the arts. Um, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics based in art. Um, so how could you, in part to also sort of bring in like, what I mean by art is not going to be the same is people who think, who do art thinking, the next generations of art thinkers that I feel I connect with um, are much more science oriented. They code, they are better at mathematics, they're much more interested in like building things and like, you know, technically um, you have artists like Bas Mafel and Ben building games. Um, I have, you know, like um, artists like sort of Sonet Sif who's now in prison in Egypt, but, you know, interested in sort of, you know, doing various things with building websites and making music and this kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, so I think there there is, um, and again, we have like a, a, a sort of a much stronger sort of overlap, mechanical engineers who want to be poets, that sort of thing. So I think that I think maybe is, is I think where I feel things might be shifting within the sort of small sort of, you know, like the concentric circles that sort of surround me. And I understand it's kind of different depending on um, where we sort of go in that regard. But yeah, I think maybe just maybe less binary thinking with regard to STEM and the arts, perhaps. Well, and world building itself relies on that sort of technical imaginary and ability to create something while also picturing things that don't exist now. And so it's a it's a place where the two come together. Ron, I'm going to give you the last couple of minutes. To sure. OK, uh, thinking and it's absolutely fascinating um, hearing you think about the scope and the future in the long term, because, you know, we're at this moment, but it's also part of a, a bigger story. And um, a couple of words come to mind very closely about, you know, how things have shifted and, and what's needed. And, you know, I think it's absolutely a call for shared compassion, as you mentioned before, Unji. And, you know, I think that's um, uh, so important. Um, tenderness, shared compassion, um, a provocation about the big questions, but also deep curiosity. And, um, you know, I think that really in whatever uh, material form or, or um, how, how people are working through these questions, if there's deep curiosity, um, there's possibility. So we'll leave um, with that notion. If there's deep curiosity, then there's possibility. Um, thank you, all three of you, for your honesty, your willingness to talk about your practice, to think through um, where to from here and um, just uh, in general for your thought partnership as we put this panel together, deeply appreciative and uh, really value the work that you're doing.
So thank you. And thanks to those who joined us. Um, we're glad you're listening. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>